Let's get started. Okay. Um, well, as already announced uh, before, um, this is the English speaking session. So, <laughs> um, and uh, we will continue with a, we have three exciting presentations uh, here. Uh, the first one will actually uh, build upon what was presented by Julian, um, basically using Alpha Zero, I understand, in a real world scenario. So, looking forward to that. Um, and let's get started. So I welcome Marcel Wasserer and Anton Fuchsjäger from Enlight AI uh, here. They will feel free to <laughs> already come on the stage. Um, they will talk about uh, how Alpha Zero and techniques like that uh, will be used in a real world scenario actually in the energy network, I understand, or power grid. Very exciting topic. Um, and well, I guess. You will introduce Enlight AI yourself, um, <laughs> but working on reinforcement learning and actually colleagues told me, we need to get in touch and stay in touch with them. They are the only company in Austria who actually do something with <laughs> reinforcement learning. So we'll see, looking forward and the stage is yours. Thanks for the intro. <laughs> so yeah, welcome to our talk about power grid congestion management. Um, yeah, we today had a unique opportunity to learn about Mu Zero and Alpha Zero by yeah, Julian himself. And we built upon the same work and yeah, extend this line of research and apply it to uh, topology optimization on power grids. So yeah, maybe a few words of Enlight about Enlighter AI. So we are a technology-driven startup based in Vienna, um, mainly focused obviously on reinforcement learning but on computer vision and GeoAI as well. And um, yeah, how did we get involved in power grid optimization? This was actually a series of, let's say, lucky coincidences because originally we applied uh, reinforcement learning in the logistics sector. Um, turned out to be yeah, quite challenging. So along the way, we developed our own reinforcement learning framework, which is called MazeIL. You can find it as open source on GitHub as well. And yeah, once we had the hammer, of course, we were looking for nails and yeah, just stumbled upon the learning to run a power grid challenge, which is organized by RTE, which is the yeah, biggest uh, grid operator in Europe. And yeah, third place was a kind of a test run for us. We did not know anything about power grids yet uh, and still achieved the third place. And then yeah, one year later, of course, we went all in and yeah, we were able to establish a new state of the art and publish this method also to the yeah, NURBS conference and yeah, received awards and so on, but most importantly, uh, we were approached by uh, real yeah, big network operators and yeah, are now in the process of, let's say, making this a reality. But first, let's talk a lo little bit about what um, the challenges actually are for grid operators. Um, so, I mean, actually, it's, it's yeah, quite, as it, it is great that already 80% of renewable energy that is brought newly to the network, that is built on, on new power generators, is already from, from uh, renewable energy sources. But this is an immense number that is uh, integrated in legacy grids. And yeah, grids just don't evolve with the same speed as, as generators can be built. Yeah, as you know, it's not that popular to build new transmission lines, um, high voltage lines. <laughs> so this is, these are projects that typically require, let's say, yeah, decades to complete. So grids are confronted with this yeah, new generation capacity, but um, yeah, can't, can't extend the same speed, so are operated much closer at the limits. And yeah, one reason is, of course, because of, uh, one additional reason is uh, that the renewable energy is yeah, very volatile by its nature, of course. Yeah, if the wind stops, then yeah, suddenly everything drops and it's only predictable to a certain extent. Long distance transmissions are also a factor, so we have a regional concentration or geographical concentration of certain yeah, generators like offshore wind parks and also, yeah, let's say, energy markets that favor the, the cross-regional um, energy exchanges. And yeah, we are expecting also that the electricity demand overall will increase in the next years once the big industries will be switching their primary, uh, primary energy to electricity. But zooming in, so I brought a, let's call it a toy problem. So this graph represents a very small grid. Um, the, the nodes are substations, and the lines are, of course, the transmission lines. Then we add the consumers. So um, in, in our case, we are mostly talking about uh, 
the transmission grid, this, this means that the consumers are quite large, uh, bigger cities, uh, entire regions or neighboring countries. And then, of course, to, yeah, to fulfill this demand, we also need to add the generators, which are yeah, uh, a mix of different uh, energy sources. So hopefully, as much as possible, um, wind and solar, but still yeah, thermal generation by, for example, gas-powered um, plants. So the, the nature of, of the renewable energy is, of course, that it's less predictable and controllable. Let's assume now that the, star, uh, that the wind uh, starts picking up on this um, wind generator. What might happen is that, yeah, on the one hand, it's nicely, which uh, is also yeah, a way of handling the congestion, and often that's already enough, and we can get rid of the, of the yeah, additional redispatching. But as easy as it looks in practice, there are a few problems with that, so my colleague will tell you more about that. All right. So I'll tell you a bit more about the method we used and how we trained our agent and how we kind of like arrived at the agent that can actually be deployed in the test setting, that is. So first of all, when we first um, were confronted with the challenge and first looked at it, we thought we, um, it kind of looked familiar because we have like an incredibly large action space. So if you, if you see here, uh, look at this power grid, for example, this is, was used in the 2021 challenge and it's still like a relatively small grid but the number of actions we can take grows exponentially with the number of links we have. So in this case, the links are like the sum of all connections over all substations. So this is already like, I think for this grid, it's um, roughly, I think it was 65,000 actions in each time step that we can take every five minutes, um, which is very, very large. And the possible state of, topology configurations over the whole network is even larger than that because obviously we can change a lot. Yeah, so when we saw this, we thought um, we have seen this before and we have seen it with Alpha Zero and Mu Zero because here as well we have like a very large action space and um, it grows as well exponentially. And it's also um, a sequential decision problem, which is also the case for power grids because actions we take now will affect very much what happens later on. So we started off with implementing our own Alpha Zero uh, implementation or like re-implemented it from the papers and the online code. And um, then noticed that our scenario differs in some aspects to the original version for used for chess and Go. So for example, we are, we are here in a single player environment because we have a readily available simulation that is already very fast, provided by, uh, it's called grid to op and it's also provided by RTE. Efficient with limited compute power. Um, similarly, MC, um, early stopping for the MCTS search and the custom action selection was introduced in order to speed up the training mainly because we didn't have that much compute power available at the time and this significantly improved performance. Right, so now I want to talk to you through a small example and to, mm -hmm. to give you an idea of how our agent acts. So here we are again in the same grid state, but we have like a congested line here due to an outage of, of this line here. And now this state is giving to the agent, the agent um, or to the neural network, which produces the uh, policy network, which gives us the top K actions for these situations, which are then expanded, simulated, and stepped into the future, as we know from Alpha Zero. And we do this until we either run out of our simulation budget or uh, until we find, like our early stopping criteria um, is satisfied. So in this case here, we, we get like a three step sequence that should solve the congestion. And if we look at the example here, we see that the first action is done here in substation 28, which kind of like um, distributes the congestion, but also reducing it already. Next up, substation 34 is modified. And then finally, substation nine is modified. And what I think this nicely demonstrates is that the actions are not very intuitive 
and very complex. So this is not something I would come up with, but the agent luckily found it and could solve the uh, congestion like this very nicely. Right, so um, after winning last year's challenge, we also wrote the paper, as Marcel mentioned, and there we also presented some results where we um, evaluated it on 52 individual weeks spanning over the whole year. And what these results demonstrate is um, our survival. So the, the scenarios are very difficult. And this gives the survived steps in percentage. And here the do-nothing policy, which does nothing, survives 90%, 19% of the steps. The current state of the art, which is redispatching, um, survives about 75% of the time, while the complete MCTS, um, or like the full MCTS with Oracle information, 77, and then the combination of both, like this is a beam search actually, based on the training of the MCTS, with redispatching achieves the best score with 82%, while at the same time reducing the redispatching by 60%, which we think is a really nice result, and which also helped us win the challenge. Um, right, finally, to wrap up, we currently, or we then looked at like, how can we apply this? How can we make this more attractive for, for real operators? And then started implementing two demos or two examples. First on the right hand side, oh, sorry, wrong button. First on the right hand side, we have an AI assistant. So this is kind of built like a game that you can play. It's on our website. Um, and there you can jump into the role of a power grid operator. The grid runs live and then arrives at the problem. And then the agent suggests different action sequences, which you can inspect and choose from. And then you can pick and see how long you survive. There are also different difficulties if you get better over time. And then lastly, we also built um, quite recently a day ahead planning tool. This is more of an analysis tool to look at different operation plans and compare them based on metrics. So this is also should be motivating for grid operators to kind of like um, investigate these new plans we kind of like can construct now that utilize um, topology optimization um, as well as redispatching in combination with different um, preference levels basically. This should be online soon as well, at the end of the week, maybe next week. Thank you. Thank you. And to the point. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Well, yes, to the point, this is it. <laughs> Thank you very much for the interesting presentation. Um, are there any questions in the audience? We have definitely time for some questions. If nobody yet, ah, to break the ice, exactly. <laughs> Um, so that generally the environment provides forecasts and it, the environment also has a simulation function and this simulation <coughs> function uses forecasts. Okay. But this is obviously a big aspect in when you simulate into the future. Mm -hmm. Yep. Maybe you can test us. It's at the level where we currently started working with a, a larger TSO, which is your tenant that operates the grid, the Dutch grid and the, the part of the German grid. And um, yeah, it's still a long way to the operation room, of course. But the left side is, is a scenario that's, that's quite nice because uh, in their head planning, uh, this is something that, that, that yeah, occurs on a regular basis, of course, and where there's not, uh, let's say, very security constrained environment for it. So this is something where we can quite quickly, I'm, I'm yeah, actually positive that it might be less than a year to show recommendations to real operators, and then they can decide if it's good enough, and we can start iterating on that. Interesting. Any, any other questions? Yeah. Mm. It's from the from the perspective of the TSO of the operator, 
they don't choose the generation mix. This is already, let's say, a market outcome. So what they do is just they want uh, they, they have to execute the plan as, as as good as they can, but during the execution sometimes yeah things happen like this wind generator by example that I had, which means then then they have to take care of that, and there the matrix is quite clear. They want to um, yeah expand as let's say as little cost as they can, and cost in their case is shifted energy. So that's yeah that's already. It's a clear, but still there's a lot of room to, um, let's say, shape uh, the reward signal in a way that, that the agent um, can easily pick up the, let's say, the, the learning process gets more efficient. So there's a large spend, but doing evaluation for the KPIs, it's quite clear what the operator expects. Thank you. We have time for one more question back there. The environment that we used uh, in the competition is, of course, a, 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 an artificial one. So this was prepared by RTE, by the French National Grid Operator. And, but they did not completely come out with, with, any, with an yeah, artificial network without any, let's say, relation to reality. They used uh, established, um, let's call it architecture. It's a test case in, in the grid world, IEEE 118. And then they matched it with what they see in their network uh, in terms of, let's say, generator patterns and, and congestion patterns that they see. Um, but this is, this is only the competition setting. So, of course, in the real world, we are integrating the uh, grid model of the, of the operator itself. Uh, this, this is again, um, it's, it, is, it is input for the, for the operator. So the market decides uh, the, the energy exchanges and the, let's say the, the utilization of the interconnects and the operator on, on let's say his res responsibility area has just to execute this, this plan. Um, but there is one interesting aspect, aspect to it. Of course, it would be interesting to, to take, uh, let's say, the European grid and look for potentials of yeah, let's say expanding or let's uh, other ways of, of aligning different TSOs, but this is something for yeah much later, I guess. Hmm. Okay, one final question, then I guess we need to move on. But feel free. Uh, <coughs> uh, <laughs> uh, what do you have to do to become an operator? Uh, how many years do you have to study? What qualifications are needed <laughs> to become an operator to make those decisions? As yeah. a human operator. Yeah, that's <laughs> there. I'm, I'm completely the wrong <laughs> person to answer it because we are like the, the wild guys coming from 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 nowhere, uh, knowing any, nothing about about grid operation. Of course, in the meantime, we we read up our bit, but still, I would not say that I'm qualified as an operator by far not. So, as far as I know, this is this is something that yeah, usually you have uh, let's say yeah, study with. I think they also differentiate between junior operators that, that do just the dispatching and the ones that do the planning. But I think it's an yeah study first of something that's related to it. And then it's uh, one year, about one year before they start really um, using that knowledge. But our it's a claim is not that we want to replace this soon and or any time soon. So it's, it's more we want to assist the operators. We know that we don't know many things <laughs> yet. Um, not yet, because they don't yet use the tool, of course, but um, at some point this will be relevant, but I think um, the first steps are really to, to show the, the options that they don't see yet, because topology optimization overall is something that they don't use in practice, because it, they, it's, it's just something that cannot be, let's say, yeah, really, really seen easily, and also it, it appears unsafe, because yeah, you need to take care of all these different um, developments that could go on. And probably also the outcome is measurable, right? You don't need an operator to measure the outcome. You can just say, okay, this is uh, a better one uh, mathematically uh, by, by a function 
Yeah, we can we can present the KPIs. We can show them there's a potential to save I don't know 60% of the of the redispatching in this scenario, or you don't need redispatching at all in that scenario. And then we can show the let's say top five options that they are, and then of course the operator needs needs to judge which one to choose itself. All right, thank you. I would suggest further question. We can move to the break. We need to have something to discuss there as well. And plus, uh, if you want to participate in that prize, you may have found someone who has done something <laughs> with one of those things listed. <laughs> and thank you as a small thank you. We have some nice oh, oh, FH thanks. branded <laughs> bottles here. Thank you. <laughs> they, are they are empty at this point. <laughs> thank you again.